Bienvenidos todos. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. You know, sometimes there's a story that just defines hypocrisy. One is how Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg bought out his neighboring mansion so he could have some privacy. Never mind the millions of Facebook users whose personal data is sold off to vulture businesses. Another is a story that broke just a few days ago. See, Exxon is the largest natural gas producer in the U.S., and if you've been following the downward spiral of U.S. energy consumption, you know that the government and big energy are pushing hard for fracking all across the country. But don't you dare frack on Exxon CEO's Rex Tillerson's yard. See, this millionaire scumbag thinks it's perfectly okay to poison the planet with toxic pollution at the hands of his precious business, but as soon as his pristine landscape gets scarred, well, that's just not acceptable. See, Tillerson and his rich neighbors have filed a lawsuit in an attempt to shut down a fracking project that's just a little too close to his Texas mansion. And they're petitioning the town to block the tower that would provide water for fracking because of how much of an eyesore it would be. In the suit, they actually go as far as claiming it's illegal and would create a noise nuisance and traffic hazards. Interestingly enough, Mr. Tillerson's day job is literally to debunk the same claims he's making in the lawsuit and to promote hydraulic fracturing. A practice has already been proven to cause earthquakes and birth defects at the very least. In fact, Tillerson has even gone as far as saying that those who oppose and try to regulate fracking are, quote, holding back the American economic recovery, growth, and global competitiveness. Wow. I find it absolutely fascinating that CEOs and politicians find it perfectly acceptable to completely strip the environment, toxify the land, and poison the air as long as it's someone else's land, someone else's family, someone else's life. I'm just waiting for Tillerson to set his own PR machine against himself. After all, he wouldn't want to be accused of holding back the growth of America, would he? Now let's break the set. and we're working very hard to make up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Surveillance in a post-9-11 world's par for the course. But when news broke in 2012 of the New York Police Department going outside of its jurisdiction to spy on large swaths of New Jersey's Muslim community, people were a little surprised. The NYPD's violation of civil liberties by indiscriminately spying on another state's religious population seemed obvious. And in 2012, eight Muslims filed a lawsuit against the city for targeting a community for its religion. But last week, a federal judge threw out the case altogether, alleging that the surveillance was not a violation of civil liberties because it conducted to prevent terrorism, even though no acts of terrorism were actually prevented from the spine. And while there's a similar case pending in Brooklyn, this ruling could set a dangerous precedent for the future. Well, earlier I was joined by Deepa Kumar, professor at Rutgers University and author of the book, Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire. I first asked her to break down why the judge justified the constitutionality of the program. If you look at the background of this case, this case was brought by the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights and Muslim Advocates on behalf of New Jersey Muslims who have been being surveilled for uh, at least the last 12 years, since 2002. So mosques and schools and community centers and student groups and even grade schoolers, by the way, were surveilled. And uh, the idea behind this lawsuit was to say that this is unconstitutional and this program should be suspended. Um, but what the judge ruled was that actually no harm was done by surveillance, you know, never mind the psychological trauma that New Jersey Muslims have faced, having infiltrators, you know, in all of their institutions and so forth. Apparently no harm was done. Apparently the harm, harm that was done was by the Associated Press which broke the story. The Associated Press did some amazing uh, investigative journalism uh, for which they won a Pulitzer Prize. 
uh, the judge decided that they were the ones who caused harm, not the actual surveillance. So here you have it in one fell swoop. You have not only the justification for racial and religious profiling, but an attack on the press, right? An attack on the Associated Press and the idea that the press should be watchdogs of the government. It is shocking that they would actually go as far as claiming that the harm wasn't the surveillance system itself. It was just the press of the fact that surveillance was happening. I mean, what do you think about that claim? Well, I think this is a completely specious claim. I think that it's this ruling absolutely sends the wrong message. It sends a green light not only to the NYPD to continue these practices of surveillance, but to, uh, to police agencies all over the country that they can, you know, with absolute impunity, violate the civil liberties of uh, Muslims. But I want to read uh, from the 10-page uh, document that the judge produced. This is what he said. He said. Quote, the police could not have monitored New Jersey for Muslim terrorist activities without monitoring the Muslim community itself. The motive for the program was not solely to discriminate against Muslims, but rather to find Muslim terrorists <laughs> hiding among ordinary law-abiding Muslims, which is just so deeply racist. You know, it's a form of cultural racism that says that people who practice Islam are sort of programmed to turn to uh, terrorist activities. And this is really the mindset of the NYPD. They released a document in 2007 called uh, Terrorism in the West, um, the Homegrown Threat, in which they argue that there is a four-step process of radicalization uh, in which if you're just a young Muslim man, you are already in stage one. Mm -hmm. Then you become religious, you stop smoking, drinking, and you turn to religion. You're on a fast track towards jihadization, right? And this is really such a simplistic and problematic notion of why people turn to violence. And frankly, this is cultural racism. Martini's a former Republican congressman, a Bush appointee. He's even been removed from a racketeering and murder case in the past for his lack of impartiality. So considering his past, how much do you think Martini's personal politics played into the ruling? Oh, I'm sure it had a lot to do with it because uh, there are at least two uh, schools of thought, if you will. The Republican school of thought, the more conservative school of thought, tends to be very simplistic in the way it views the Muslim terrorist uh, enemy threat. Um, and I have no doubt that that played a huge role in, in this. How is the NYPD justifying spying on locations completely outside of its jurisdiction? Yes, well, uh, frankly, this entire program is not legal because a CIA agent was responsible for setting this program up. So first of all, the CIA should not be involved in any kind of domestic uh, uh, spying of this sort. So there is so many ways in which, you know, what the NYPD should be doing, what the CIA should be doing has been completely uh, violated in this case. And, you know, the case was actually brought by a man uh, by the name of Hassan. He is a... Uh, army veteran and, you know, I believe went off to fight in the Iraq war, but then he comes back and finds that his uh, mosque is being surveilled. So, you know, the logic is we'll send you to go fight for oil and so forth. But when you come back, you're part of a suspect community. Unbelievable. Um, Deepa, you mentioned kind of the, the message, the clear message that this ruling sends. I mean, expand on that. What kind of precedent do you think that it will set for future widespread surveillance by law enforcement agencies across the country? Well, um, you know, you have to, there's already been since 2002 widespread programs of this sort. The NYPD is not the only institution, the FBI, various, uh, you know, local police departments have been involved in this. But the key to keep in mind is that in New Jersey, for instance, even though this program has been in effect since 2002, there has not been one single lead related to terrorist activity, let alone a terrorism conviction, right? And actually, this is consistent with uh, nationwide statistics in the 10 years since 9-11, of the 150,000 murders in the United States, Muslim Americans have been responsible for only 33 of them, right? And so the question is, why are so many resources spent by local police departments, by the FBI, by the National Security Agency, and so on, surveilling uh, Muslim Americans? Well, what it comes down to, I think, really, is that we have seen the massive development and growth of a not only a surveillance state, but a national security state that relies on this logic that there is a 9-11 around the corner, there are these horrible Muslim terrorists everywhere, so we have to expand this national security state. And ultimately, uh, Abby, let's be clear, 
this national security state isn't about keeping us safe, right? You think about what Americans die from. They die far more often from things like workplace-related injuries. 45,000 Americans die each year from lack of access to health care, right? But there's no war on the for-profit health care system. What it is, I want, I'm arguing in the next book that I'm writing, is really about a national security state that guards the interests of the 1%, mm -hmm. right? And uh, justifying that national security state is about creating this enemy and creating these programs that go after, by the way, not just Muslim Americans, but all dissenters. Do you think that the election of New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has made a tangible difference in both the approach of minority surveillance and stop and frisk tactics? Because I know a lot of people are kind of disappointed so far. Yeah, I mean, rhetorically, I think it's made some difference because de Blasio ran on a platform where he not only rejected stop and frisk, but he also promised uh, Muslims in New York uh, City that he would curtail, you know, the sort of blanket surveillance program, and only in specific cases where there was actionable intelligence, uh, he would sanction this kind of surveillance. But to the best of my knowledge, Abby, he hasn't actually done anything about it. And the one thing that he has done is actually uh, appoint uh, uh, a new police commissioner who, you know, if you know who this man is, William Bratton, he was uh, the chief of the LAPD. And while there, actually the number of stop and frisk uh, cases expanded by 50%. And furthermore, he was part of putting forward, uh, you know, a, an L.A. version of the New York program. It was called a community mapping program, which was going to do exactly the same thing with uh, Muslim Americans. It didn't come to fruition because there was a huge public outcry. Deepa Kumar, professor, Rutgers University, author, Islamophobia and the Politics of the Empire. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Stick around, you guys. I'll break down the real welfare problem in this country. Patients are forced to it. Explosion near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. More than a thousand people have gathered. What is the latest that you're hearing about the number of victims? <laughs> Did you know the press is the only industry specifically mentioned in the Constitution? That's because a free and open press is critical to our democracy. In fact, the single biggest threat facing our nation today is the corporate takeover of our government and our press. We've been hijacked by a handful of powerful transnational corporations they will profit by destroying what our founding fathers once built up. I'm Tom Hartman, and on this show, we reveal the big picture of what's actually going on in the world. We go beyond identifying the problem. We try to fix it. Rational debate and a real discussion of the critical issues facing America. Stand by on camera. Go. Ready to join the movement? Then welcome to the big picture. the most controversial and politicized issues in America is welfare. Yes, I'm talking about all those statists who can't keep their grubby hands out of Uncle Sam's pockets. Well, on the heels of Obama signing a farm bill that will cut funding to food stamps by $8 billion, a new report by Good Jobs First has exposed the absurd amount of taxpayer dollars that are going to provide welfare, not for the poor, but for wealthy corporations. Of course, corporate welfare is not really mentioned on the corporate press as a problem, but I wonder why. Couldn't have anything to do with the fact that it's owned by five corporations, could it? Well, the report is aptly titled Subsidizing the Corporate 1%, revealing that state and local governments have shelled out at least $110 billion to companies doing business in the U.S. of A. The study compiles figures over several years, analyzing the many ways these companies are enjoying special treatment, which can come in the form of everything from utility discounts to cash giveaways. In theory, the government justifies corporate subsidies to incentivize business growth and to support startup industries. And if applied in that way, I'm not entirely against it. But the stats and lack of transparency paint a much different picture. 
See, the majority of these subsidies are going to only a select few of the richest of the rich companies in the country. So which mega corporations are benefiting the most? Well, first off, there's Dow Chemical, a $57 billion company that's been exploiting U.S. energy policy for years. Dow has surpassed any other corporation on the list by the sheer number of subsidies it's received, 416 in total, adding up to $1.4 billion. Next up, digital science company Intel, which manufactures aerospace components, made number three on the list, which 58 subsidies totaling $3.8 billion. Or take Alcoa Aluminum Company, which has taken in 91 subsidies totaling $5.6 billion. In fact, the amount that Alcoa receives in government handouts far exceeds their annual profits. As journalist David Johnston points out, on the basis of its pre-tax income for the last four years, these subsidies amount to all the pre-tax profits Alcoa can expect for the next 189 years. Wow. So this company is essentially running on government cash. Nice. Also interesting that Alcoa makes no public mention of these massive subsidies at its annual shareholders meeting. Finally, topping the list at number one cash cow recipient is Boeing, with 137 subsidies totaling a staggering $13 billion. Now, Boeing is notorious for holding jobs hostage while states fight each other for its contracts. This $13 billion in handouts reflects the amazing deals Lucky Boeing has clearly made with states like Washington and South Carolina. Keep in mind that Boeing is the number two provider for America's military machine, which I don't think is an industry that deserves financial breaks. Guys, the subsidies in this report are often in the form of tax abatement, which underscores exactly how much burden falls on average taxpayers. Because many of these massive corporations are relying on government welfare for profit in place of actually earning the money from their sales. An organization called Citizens for Tax Justice points out that at the end of the day, this tax burden hits the poor especially hard, adding that, quote, in every state, low-income taxpayers pay more as a share of income than the wealthiest 1%. Remember, this report doesn't even take into account federal subsidies, which highlights the need for more transparency on the issue of corporate welfare. So you tell me which makes more sense, continuing to bicker about food stamps or addressing the insane corporate welfare that actually perpetuates poverty, all in the name of job creation. Yeah, I take no prisoners, you call it aggressive, but all I see is lies coming out of your message. What, what, what you say? America is one of the only so-called representative democracies in the world that is utterly dominated by two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, the left versus the right. It's all a manufactured paradigm, when in reality, both parties are more in line with each other than the majority of Americans are in line with them. What's even more frustrating is how hard it is to break through the political system as an independent or third-party candidate without being completely marginalized by the media. Well, one woman is taking that chance. Her name is Marianne Williamson, and she's running as an independent for California's 33rd District. But she's also been a New York Times best-selling author in the subject of spirituality and self-improvement four different times. She joins me now to talk about her transition from self-help guru to politician. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Marianne, you're primarily known as a spiritual teacher and author, not exactly something someone, someone associates with politics. So why did you decide to jump into the political ring? Well, isn't that the problem, though, that anybody is not associated with politics? Isn't part of the problem that we have a kind of political class and politics has become a kind of spectator sport? Everybody should feel that they're part of that show. Even Eisenhower said politics should be the part-time profession of every American citizen. A very good point. I totally agree with you. It's time to take it out of the inside baseball. Um, in, a Huffington exactly. Post, in a Huffington Post op-ed you wrote recently entitled, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Primary, I wanted to read a quote from it. Uh, we don't have an open political system. We have a political elite ruled by political parties that decides who gets to play. Whoever's playing, however nice a person, is part of the same conversation we've been having for years, the stale, worn-out rhetoric that promises to do little more than perpetuate the system as it is. I cannot agree more with that. How have you experienced this phenomenon firsthand as someone running outside of that two-party structure? 
Well, you know, I think more than anything else, we just have to disenthrall ourselves, as, as Lincoln would say. It's just a thought we have. You know, we have a two-party duopoly, as you're well aware, and it, it has a chokehold on the system, and it's sucking the oxygen out of our public discourse. But there's no need for it. I think Americans just need to be taught some of our own history. There's no mention of political parties in our founding documents. George Washington warned us against them in his farewell address. Abolition did not come from a major party. Suffrage did not come from a major party. The civil rights movement did not come from a major party. The parties, although they certainly have their role to play, um, but they should be here to serve us. We shouldn't be having to filter all of our thoughts through their ideologies. And, you know, JFK said we should be seeking not the Democratic answer or the Republican answer, but the right answer. Mm -hmm. And at a time today, as you mentioned yourself, when the more disturbing news is how similar they are compared to how dissimilar they are, I think it's time for some voices that just don't buy into the idea that we have to be one or the other. And you've described yourself as a lifelong Democrat, yet you're running as an independent. Why did you choose to distance yourself from the party, and what do you see as the most fundamental flaw of the left-wing establishment? <clears throat> well, I don't think of myself as really distancing from the party. I think the party has distanced itself from me. Um, I think if you look at someone like Bernie Sanders, he, he acts in many cases more like a Democrat, as I think of a Democrat acting, than many Democrats do. And so what's happened today is the progressives have this codependent relationship with the Democratic Party. They keep getting more corporatist and in many cases more militarist. And progressives say, oh, okay, and enable them one more time. Um, one thing you have to give to the to the Tea Party, they're not in a codependent relationship with the Republican Party. And I think it's really important for progressives who are treated like the Democratic Party in too many cases, not all cases, but in too many, like, you know, we, we come to you when there's an election, we ignore you till the next one. I just think many of us can't toe the line anymore. I just know that I can't. But I would caucus with Democrats. I, you know, like I said, I am a Bobby Kennedy Democrat, and it's hard like Wellstone said, I'm from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. It's hard for me, as a Democrat, to find too much comfort anymore within the purview of the Democratic Party. Well, but yeah. I'm, you know, I'm open. I hope that this election, you know, one of the reasons I hope I win, Abby, is because I think it would really perhaps inspire a movement by which uh, the Democrats get their soul back. Not the people, but the party. Sure. Uh, well, I, I've heard some people say that if Nixon were running today, he'd be the most liberal Democrat out there. It's pretty shocking how far right everything has kind of shifted. Let's talk about your fundraising efforts. According to Open Secrets, you've already raised over $382,000, <laughs> far surpassing your other opponents. How have you been able to do this? It's grassroots. You know, part of the way Americans are locked out today, and that's why I'm running this campaign, the average American is locked out of what should be considered the minimum in terms of access to political influence, educational opportunity, and economic opportunity. And the way that works, of course, with this legalized system of bribery and corruption we have, especially since Citizens United, by which moneyed forces wield such disproportionate influence over our political system compared to the average citizen, is how expensive it is to run for office. If you don't either have wealth or have access to wealth. So I looked at my 400,000 names on, on Facebook and my 200,000 on Twitter because I, I have been writing books, you know. Uh, my first book came out in 1992, so I've been out there for a while. And I thought to myself, looking at my social media, um, numbers, I thought, well, if everybody sends me $5, I could do this. And my, it's a grassroots campaign. I've announced publicly I'm not taking PAC money, I'm not taking lobbyist money, and my average donation is $59. Amazing. So I, yeah, and I, that's how it should be. When, sure, I'm sorry. sure, sure, sure. No, no, I, um, we're almost out of time. I just wanted to get to a couple more things, but that is incredible. But you're saying that you're still not being treated as a legitimate candidate even though you, you've made a lot of money um, through grassroots fundraising. I mean, what yeah. other factors are leading to your dismissal? Well, you know what the factors are, is this sort of media political e elite, but it's okay. I mean, that's what I would, if I were the Democrats today, my strategy would be to ignore me and pretend that I don't exist. So, you know, I can't blame them for that. Um, I just, uh, and, and the media, you know, I think when Henry Waxman first announced his retirement, it's all horse races, isn't it? So in the horse race, is it this Democrat or that Democrat? But, you know, part of running with any real principle is that the horse race isn't what you're doing this for. And, you know, the only, the only 
The only thing that matters is what the voters have to say on June 3rd, on our primary, June 3rd. So I think a lot of people are coming to understand that I would not be a threat to the Democratic Party. I don't think anybody sees Bernie Sanders as a threat to the Democratic Party. And also, uh, people are coming to understand that he doesn't lack power in the Senate. I, I, I think that people here in Los Angeles are beginning to understand that the election of an independent candidate, particularly someone running on the platform of getting the money out of politics, would really help create a space, an opening, a possibility for this kind of a candidacy and a winning candidacy throughout the country. And L.A. likes to do things first. You know, this, this is a, a district that doesn't really like same old, same old anything. And people are really responding to the idea that we start new conversations here. This is what we do. This is why people live in California. California, this area starts a new conversation. It's a national trend within five years. And I think that's one of the selling points of this campaign. I think it's an exciting idea that it's just not going to be perpetuating the system as it is when all of us know it's not working. Uh, indeed, California could set uh, a lot of things in motion here. Let's talk about some of the other major points of your political platform. You're on board <clears throat> with several bills that Representative Barbara Lee has proposed, including the moratorium on the use of drones, the repeal of the authorization for use of military force. I mean, as much as I believe in these things, these issues seem to be dead in the water on Capitol Hill. How would you get Congress to seriously consider them? Well, listen, I'm not naive about what one a uh, congresswoman can do, particularly a first-term congressperson, who, particularly now that it's an open seat, anybody will be. So I'm not naive. I wouldn't be going to Washington with a magic wand. No one would, and no one should be able to. But on the other hand, I think conviction is a force multiplier. And particularly as an independent candidate, not feeling shackled, um, I think that my uh, hopefully the contribution of my voice both within Congress and because I have a national platform of some kind outside Congress as well to um, use whatever uh, power that I have in terms of, of audience nationally to talk about these things in a way that makes more people wake up and more people ask their Congress people and their candidates around the country what are, what's going on with these drones I don't think the average person even realizes Abby uh, the power of these things they will they can know who you slept with what you just logged on to on your computer, what room you just walked into. And they are coming. And you know, the same, the same government that has had to have been forced to acknowledge NSA spying tells us in relation to drones not to worry because they are going to have to adhere to all privacy laws, state, federal, and local. Americans who listen to this are guffawing. We just need to, to continue the buzz. It's like you create with your show. A lot of voices are out there now. I think something's already rumbling, and I just believe that these voices need to also be represented in electoral something, candidacies like mine. Something is definitely brewing a revolution of consciousness. Thanks for being a part of that. Marianne Williamson, congressional Thank candidate, you. California's District 33. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. That's our show, you guys. Join me again tomorrow when I break the set all over again. Energy consumption. You know that the government and big energy are pushing hard for fracking all across the country. But don't you dare frack on Exxon CEO's Rex Tillerson's yard. See, this millionaire scumbag thinks it's perfectly okay to poison the planet with toxic pollution at the hands of his precious business. But as soon as his pristine landscape gets scarred, well, that's just not acceptable. See, Tillerson and his rich neighbors have filed a lawsuit in an attempt to shut down a fracking project that's just a little too close to his Texas mansion. And they're petitioning the town to block the tower that would provide water for fracking because of how much be acceptable to completely strip the environment, toxify the land, and poison the air as long as it's someone else's land, someone else's family, someone else's life. I'm just waiting for Tillerson to set his own PR machine against himself. After all, he wouldn't want to be accused of holding back the growth of America, would he? Now let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No one's. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television.
sort of an eyesore it would be. In the suit, they actually go as far as claiming it's illegal. It would create a noise nuisance and traffic hazards. Interestingly enough, Mr. Tillerson's day job is literally to debunk the same claims he's making in the lawsuit and to promote hydraulic fracturing, a practice that has already been proven to cause earthquakes and birth defects at the very least. In fact, Tillerson has even gone as far as saying that those who oppose and try to regulate fracking are, quote, holding back the American economic recovery, growth, and global competitiveness. Wow. I find it absolutely fascinating that CEOs and politicians find it perfectly. Bienvenidos todos. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. You know, sometimes there's a story that just defines hypocrisy. One is how Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg bought out his neighboring mansion so he could have some privacy. Never mind the millions of Facebook users whose personal data is sold off to vulture businesses. Another is a story that broke just a few days ago. See, Exxon is the largest natural gas producer in the U.S., and if you've been following the downward spiral of U.S. 